Uh, welcome back. Uh, good morning. <laughs> uh, so welcome to the lecture three of PID functions on ZP. So I'll start by having some sort of comments about what we talked about yesterday. Uh, so last time we, uh, we kind of end with the theorem, which where we somehow we talk about this exponential function, yeah, I think expo exponential functions, where this exponential x is defined to be, you know, one plus, x, just like the usual Taylor expansion, one plus x plus, excuse me, two x squared plus, maybe two factorial, of course, it's, and then go on, so on, go on as this, and then somehow it turns out be, be, if your x, if your x belongs to PZP, then this sort of infinite sequence will converge to a number, a p adjacent number, and turns out which because turns out somehow like after the, the second term, these will be always divisible by p. Therefore, it will be one. This will land in one plus p z p. Moreover, this sort of will turn addition into multiplication. So he suggested a different, slightly different way to see this. Uh, I'll say, maybe I'll say that in a bit. Uh, so there's a way to define the map on the, in the other direction by taking the log of x. Basically, you t if you start with something in which comes to one modulo p looks like one plus PA, and then you can just expand it again using Taylor expansions. Uh, so you have PA and, you know, minus PA square over two and then PA cube over three and, and go on and on. And this will converge as well. And therefore you have mapped both ways and this will define an isomorphism between these two things. And definitely, you know, the log function will turn multiplication into addition and the exponent will turn addition into multiplication that it will get an actual a group, a group isomorphism maybe. Or maybe a topological group isomorphism. Uh, so he suggested some sort of a comment on this. So one way is to make feel like this is a little, how should I put this? It's a little not not very hand on. This is the way I wrote this. He suggested there's another way to write this map. Uh, of course, it diff will be a different map, but still going to be isomorphism. The mapping going this way looks maybe a little bit more familiar to you. It's, uh, sorry, excuse me. It it it, look, it goes like sending x to, uh, uh, how should I put this? Uh, if maybe I should say sending p uh, maybe p a, which is going to be my x, to one plus p to the eighth power. And this is also a well defined map. And what we're going to do is in the exercise. I think in the, one of the exercises, I ask you to show that this type of things will converge, even if. You know, a is this will make sense even if a is not an integer, it's just a, you know, a p adjacent number. This will still makes sense, but these two are in some sense are actually roughly the same, in the sense that you can re also rewrite this as in a, in a completely formal way. That this is actually the same ex exponential of log of one plus p times a. If you're trying to think of it as a f completely formally, so you know, in the real world, one plus p to the a is e to the log of one plus p times a. So it's basically what we're doing. And log of one, one plus p is as explained over here. You just take this sort of, uh, Taylor expansion of this. And in fact, somehow you can take, you don't have to take one plus p, you can take it one plus two p or one plus three p, you know, anything you want, as long as it's sort of, if you take one plus p squared, it'll be, different. It'll be very different. If you take sort of one plus something invertible in P and then times P, then you essentially get roughly the same thing off by, basically off by a multiple of A in some sense. So if you compare this exponential X and exp this thing here, they're basically, they're off by, they're basically off by, by some number like log of one plus P over P, a multiple of this. So these short maps are essentially the same up to some small things. Uh, he's also suggested that somehow another way to think of this through exponential is that, uh, is that somehow in this p-adic world, the number p or anything divided by p is considered very small. So think about, you know, in the real world, your x is now a kind of very small number. If you do this or Taylor expansion, this will kind of converge. And in fact, in the real world, it doesn't matter what the real norm of x is. It will automatically converge. In the sense that you know, for any x, the, the, this, this Taylor expansion will converge. The reason is that you know, in the long run, 
you're dividing a n factorial here. This in the real in, in the real world is very good because you have a you know number divided by a huge number in the denominator. Is, th th therefore, the absolute value becomes very very small. So this converges very fast. On the other hand, in the PLD was dividing by something. It's dividing by something is not that good. If you divide by something, it turns out well you know if you have especially if you have p in the denominator, if you divide by that, the norm the PI norm will get large. So therefore, having this n factor in the denominator is not a good thing for you. It's actually works against you. It turns out that this Taylor expansion you have over here in the periodic world, this, uh, maybe I just write, so this, this has a finite radius of convergence. In the periodic world. So that's another comment I will, I guess, I will make here. Uh, right. Uh, right. Maybe another, just give another example of this. We're moving on to the next kind of theorem I want to talk about. Move on a little bit. So, uh, so, so yes, I was asked the question, what about, you know, if the Hansel's lemma, what if the simple, uh, you know, so Hansel's lemma says if modulo p have a simple zero, you can lift all the way to zp a simple zero. But what if that simple zero condition fails? I give an example of like x square coming to uh, so x square equals to five in z five, and show that that doesn't have a lift. But actually, in some cases, even if the simple zero condition fails, you might might still be able to lift it all the way. Here's another example, maybe. Uh, maybe consider x cube equal to one. Excuse me, maybe x cubed equals to 10 in z3. And this, in fact, you can lift, I mean, of course, like mod, mod, if you mod 3, you see that x cubed equals congruent to 1 mod 3. And this is sort of this, I mean, like maybe I write it like this way. And therefore, th but this is x1 minus 1 to the cube. So therefore, the, the 1 is not a simple 0, it's a repeated 0. But this 1 does lift, there is a lift of this to z3. In fact, we can do it this way. Uh, so, so think about what we're gonna do. Well, what we wanna do it. So let me do it somehow. A cool. You can, you can, you can solve by Hansel's way. But I'm gonna do it in a in a really interesting way. So what do I do with this? So let's see. I have. I, what I want is that I want this to the one over three power, right? That's what I really want. So here's a game. So how do you do this? So sort of binomial expansion anyway. So this is sort of summation of all the i greater than equal to zero of what is this? So n choose i x to the i, right? So that's how you expand it. The binomial expansion. Now I'm gonna write the same thing. So I wanna write, okay. So I'm gonna just formally write sum of i greater than equal to zero of now my n is one third, that's fine. Just write one third. Let's formally write it and then explain what happened. And then Yang, I've lost you. I can't hear you. Can't hear either. Yang, can't see the screen. We can't hear you. Looks like he's completely dropped.
Hello, Liang. Uh, I think. Can you can you give me the ability to share the screen? Let me just share the screen. Yep. Thank you. Interesting that you know, uh, uh, I can hear you. You told you told me that I'm uh, I'm, I'm lost, but when I speak, you don't you don't hear me. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. Okay, so that's good. Uh, so where did I lose you? Uh, I think you were about to start with the proof of the theorem, right? No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm I'm explaining this. Your box, you had written exactly that that box binomial expansion. That's where it stopped. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, I wrote this binomial expansion. Good. I just lost you for like a second or so. Okay, I was I was gonna explain uh, why this is a converging thing, or rather, I should probably just 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 say that what the thing is. This is what this is just formula. You just write down i factor in the bottom, and then you do one third times one third minus one, and one third minus two, and then let me just get rid of this thing over here. Dot 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 one third minus i plus one. It's just that product, and you was, and it's it's an exercise to show that this this nine to the i will trump over these sort of denominators, and then there and also this this denominators over here, and that gives you a converging sequence. So so here's maybe a kind of a slogan that any sort of a formal expression you can write down, as long as this sort of this infinite sequence will converge, periodically, it's a valid expression, and all these sort of formal structures, of like you know for example this. To the third power is what you want it to be. Continue to hold. This is something interesting in periodic world. Like you can use all these, <laughs> all these sort of crazy expressions to do things. Maybe I kind of was, before I explain the next theorem. Let me sort of stop here and then see if there's any question about these comments. I don't see any questions, but if there are any, I'll, I'll let you know. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, you can interrupt me anytime. Uh, hold on a sec. So let me now explain the theorem here, which is that it's a structure theorem for the ZP cross. So, just me. Okay. So, so first of all, I want to explain the first. So I want to, so the, I, let's read it first. ZP cross, namely all the elements in ZP where P does not divide A. And this is form a, form a group and a multiplication. And I'm claiming that you can break, the part, break this thing in part uh, into just a finite group, Z mod P, Z cross, and an infinite group, group like this. Moreover, uh, and OPP greater than three, of course. And, and moreover, this one plus P, Z, P, as we just somehow proved here, by the theorem that this one plus ZP with multiplicative group is really isomorphic to PZP. But of course, you can divide by P always. So therefore, you get ZP plus here. So the latter part we already kind of explained as above. So this is already kind of explained. And now I have to explain this one. Maybe here's a, here's a kind of a, before explaining what this kind of a convince you, this is something that kind of works is that there's also sort of a, Finite version of this, in the sense that if you take ZP, uh, somehow ZP mod P to the N ZP cross. In fact, you can show that this is the same as I mean, just ZP mod N P to the N ZP is the same as Z mod P to the N Z. And this, what I'm saying here, this is a, actually this is a, a cyclic group. Order p to the p minus one times p to the n minus one, and we learned that you know if it's a cyclic group of, of this order, then this is, must be isomorphic to z mod p minus one z cross z mod p to the n minus one z. And what I'm doing here is that this part, this multiplicative thing, is really just this thing, and this kind of degenerate to this one. Because I'm using sort of a mod p to the n version of this, so this is sort of a finite version of what the isomorphism I have up, up here, above here. But in fact, this sort of this, this isomorphism passed to limit. So let, let's explain this proof. So let's first of all recall that 
that actually p minus one equals one has solutions in z p cross. So in particular, so in particular, this uh, I have a I have a way to embed back the, all the piece of unity. This is all the piece roots of unity. Uh, oh, excuse me, p minus what first roots of unity? My bad. Back to z p cross. So this is a, the, the, the Teichmiller lift I talked about last time. It's called the Teichmiller lift. And also we talked about last time that this is sort of multiplicative. So therefore, this embedding here actually respect the group structure and I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of that. Now our goal is to relate these two. So, so let's write down the isomorphism between the two. So I want uh, something in ZP cross. Oh, maybe I should point out, I wrote upper cross on the, on the ring to mean invertible elements in here, and it's a group under the multiplication. So this, when I wrote this, you, I indicate that this is under multiplication, multiplication group. So I want to say, I want to construct an isomorphism this way. The scale as follows. So maybe maybe go this way. Let's let's go go backwards first. Let's start with something a bar, you know, something here, and then something looks like one plus p b, on the backwards. Basically, well, I mean, I mean, this one plus z p is already in z p cross, and just have to make this thing into z p cross. So that's exactly the Teichmiller lift. So I just map to the Teichmiller lift of this times one plus b p, p b. So I map this way. And then I want to go backwards, right? I, if I want to get isomorphism, I need to go backwards. I start with C here. And there's a natural way to Liang, I can see your screen. I don't hear you. I don't, I don't hear anything. Hello? Hello. No, can't hear you. Liang, I made you presenter again. Sorry, I'll, I'll unmute you. Yeah. Okay, okay. You hear me now? Yeah. I can hear you too. Okay. Yes, thank you. Can you. See the screen? I can see the screen and now I can see the notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I apologize for this. Uh. 
Bad. Stopped hearing you when you started talking about the inverse map. Okay. Wait. Okay. Start from C. Starting from C. Yeah. I, I, uh, the first one is definitely C mod P. And the next one, I don't know what it is. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, the composition, I get identity. Right? So let's solve this. What, what is X? X is so that when I multiply back, I get to C. So C must be equal to C mod P times X. So you know what X is. <laughs> so X is just C mod the Teichmann lift of C mod P. Let's, let, let's sort of explain this a little bit more in the more example way. So here's, here's an example. P equals seven. And I wanna write this isomorphism like this. Okay, so I wanna say, for example, what ten, where 10 goes. So first of all, 10 goes to mod seven. This is the same as, uh, excuse me, three mod seven. And what is this? Well, by definition, this is 10 over bracket three, right? So it's bracket 10 is the same, that 10, same as that bracket three. But what is bracket three? Bracket three, I think I, I gave last time the expression of this is roughly speaking uh, uh, three plus four times seven plus something, okay? But rather, I mean, like, I want to divide by this. I, I could do the division, but it's a little bit uh, inconvenient. So maybe I note this. So this three times five is congruent to mod seven. So therefore, what happens is that if I divide 10 by this three, that's the same. And so this will tell you that three times five is the Teichmann of one, which is just one. So therefore, 10 divided by the Teichmann of three is 10 times Teichmann of five. So I have to recall what Teichmann of five was. It was five plus two times seven plus three times seven cube and so on and so forth. And then you just multiply them together, you know, 10 times that. And that's your answer here. Oh, bad, 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 bad. And you can kind of see already that somehow if you multiply the first two terms here, that gives you 50, which is come to one mod seven. And then of course, that switch back to later terms and you have to do the multiplication. Explicit. If you want to have an explicit expression of what this number is, I guess. So I hope this gives you some idea of what this ISO what goes into this isomorphism. We will stop here to see if there's any questions about this theorem. So this gives the structure of ZP cross. Let's recall that you know in Keith's lecture that ZP cross is a Galois group of the cyclotomic uh, P cyclotomic extension. So it has some sort of a finite part and then some sort of completely looks like a ZP part. Questions? No questions? Okay, so so that was somehow. <laughs> I guess I'm a little bit behind my schedule. But let's see how far I can get to. Uh, uh, you know, I'll try to catch up, or we as people will still understand things, of course. So today I'm going to talk about. Hmm? All good. Good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so today, uh, where like the, the plan of the third lecture was to start talking about so-called Piatifana space. Again, remember that our slogan is that many theories over R has their analogs, has their analogs over QP. So we're gonna do this. So there's a, over R, there's so-called Banach space, so also Hilbert space. We're gonna make their analogs today. And also I'll talk about the very important thing which is called a Mahler basis for the continuous function of ZP. That's gonna be very important for our later discussion. And if time permits, I'll talk about PI measures that we'll see. So let's first of all recall what Bana space over R means. And basically, I just tell you what it is. So basically, Bana space over R is a R vector space. It's infinite dimensional. Uh, usually, I mean, usually we talk about infinite dimensional vector spaces, of course. And it's complete with respect to a norm. We can talk about the norm there. Maybe it's, uh, maybe talk about the example before giving the axioms. So I can talk about sort of continuous functions on open interval zero and one. And uh, so I can take a norm, namely it takes the maximum absolute value on this between on this function between zero and one. So what does this sort of norm set, what kind of property does this norm certify? Well, if you have some number in R, 
to multiply with your, your function by this number, then the norm will be multiplied by the same, the absolute value of this number, of course. And if I have two functions, f and g, then the norm, I mean, in this case, it was basically, in this case, it's just norm of f plus g is less equal to the norm of, or the maximum value of f plus the maximum value of g, of course. And the third one is that if the maximum value of f is zero, of course, I would say f is zero. And of course, if f is zero, then of course, max value is zero. So that's what balance space over real means. So we can sort of essentially copy the same definition. Balance space over QP is, again, a QP vector space. And basically, these two are, so if you look very carefully, I think I, oh, no, actually not. I thought I copied and pasted the two words. But anyways. <laughs> Not quite. So P I balance space V over Q P is a is a Q P vector space. It's complete with respect to a norm. It's just like you what you have over here. It's a, it's a real value norm, but the vector space is over Q P. And it's compatible with the it's sort of multiplication by a P I number. So what happens? The norm will be multiplied by the P I norm. And the second and the third condition is also essentially the same thing. And this, what distinguishes two cases is the, the, the second condition. Over here, we have so-called triangle inequality. Over here, we have the stronger triangle inequality. Remember that in the periodic world, we always use a, triangle, a stronger triangle inequality to uh, maybe strong, I don't know, strong triangle inequality to mean to, to somehow get a really a good way to converging. And also this is sort of adapted to the intrinsically to the periodic situation. And uh, well, I, I probably won't have time to talk about the so-called Hilbert, called Hilbert space. Uh, I'll only say a little bit maybe later. But in a Hilbert space, when, when your balance space has some sort of over R, has some sort of inner product structure, you can take so-called orthonormal basis. In the periodic world, we have something similar. We say, okay, if my periodic space V has an orthonormal basis, you know, some EI in V, if the following two conditions holds. First of all, I want to say, well, I mean, the first condition is basically is normal. I want all the, the basis vectors EI have norm one, of course. And the next condition is, is some sort of a normal, it's, some, it's a basis condition. Uh, well, uh, it's in a complete sense. In the sense that every vector V in V can be written uniquely, uniqueness is somehow important, as a converging limit. Somehow you basically, you want to write your V as a linear combination of the basis element. But your basis can have infinite many elements in the basis. So you should write some sort of infinite formal sum like this. Where coefficient belongs to QP. But of course, you want your formal sum, infinite formal sum, to be convergent in some reasonable way. So, what that means is that, as a third condition later, uh, what that means is that, for example, if I is you know, indexed by the natural numbers, what we want is this norm of, of these coefficients go to zero and indices go to infinity. Or if you, if you put it another way, in fact, this, the next description works in general. That means that if you fix any epsilon, excuse me, epsilon bigger than zero, then there are only finite many i's such that the norm of this ai is, is less, uh, excuse me, is, sorry. My bad, it's greater than equal to epsilon. No matter if you fix whatever this epsilon, how small it is, there's only finite many. Uh, terms where the coefficient is bigger than this epsilon. So therefore, you know, it, it, if you want to converge, I guess somehow the, up to somehow a small epsilon, you just need to add finite many terms. And note that also, this is also I want to point out where in the we have this strong inequality here. And therefore, the converse condition is not somehow saying some sort of a you know, a sum of the rest remainder term is the norm is less than equal to zero, less than equal to some epsilon. But rather, as long as each single term is less than equal to epsilon, then their corresponding sum will be also have norm less than equal to that epsilon. So this 
so somehow the convergence is much easier in the periodic world. So that explains the work. So, so the first term explains the normal. Next condition explains the basis. Now I want to explain also what author means, orthogonal means. So it means that if you take the norm of this vector as written here, then that's just the, the maximum norm of the PI norm of all the coefficients. Because we know that, like all but finite, so so this norm, this norm of these AIs will go to zero as I go to infinity. So the max will always achieve that some for some AI. So uh, I want to make a sort of a quick remark that in some sense this also normal basis concept is a PI analog of the Hilbert space. In the sense that. In the Hilbert space, I have some sort of inner inner progress structure, and the norm will satisfy. Oh, sorry, not that. So plus uh, norm v minus. Oh, sorry. Of course. Like if the, if the two, excuse me. Yeah, if the if the if the two vectors v and w are orthogonal to each other, then the norm of v square plus norm of w square is v plus w square. But now, orthogonal in the periodic world would mean that if you take norm of V plus W, it's precisely the maximum of the two norms, v, uh, uh, two vector, normal two vectors, V and W. In some sense, this looks like, a, I think it's more of like an L1 space in some sense. And here's maybe a kind of a typical example of a Banach space with a orthonormal basis. Let's see. So this, I'm gonna call it L1 because it looks like L1. It's a sequence of numbers. A1 dot 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 through A QP. I mean, this is analogous, maybe I should, before doing this, this is analogous to this, this example I have over here. Over here, I have some sort of functions on between zero and one. But instead, over here, and somehow I, I think of this maybe another way to write this is I have some, for func some function from the natural numbers to QP. So that's somehow it's the same as sequence of numbers in QP. But then I want, uh, I want my, oh, maybe not quite the same. Anyway, I, I, I want my, and limit of these numbers to the PI norm is limit goes to zero. And now if I have a sequence of these numbers, I want to define its norm for this L1 norm to be just the maximum of all these coefficients because the limit goes to zero, therefore the maximum is always achieved by something. And now if I do this norm, also a normal basis will be just e EN where, you know, this um, only one happens at the nth place, and the other terms are zero. And therefore, this sequence a n will be just basically sum of a n times this sort of standard, you know, e n, which is sort of one at the nth place. And this norm is precisely the maximum of all the periodic norms of these coefficients. And that's as defined over here anyways. Okay. So, right. So this is what periodic Banach space looks like. Are there any questions about this before I move on? To give you a, a very, I should say, very non-trivial example of pi the norm, which is somehow very important for us later. Just concept pi norm, pi spaces. No questions so far, but I'll let you know. Sounds good. Thank you. So now let's move on to this particular theorem. I'm interested in. So this is sort of the topic of this uh, my lecture series lectures is about piazza numbers on ZP. So I want to consider sort of, uh, a continuous function from ZP with values in uh, on ZP with values in Z in QP. So that's what, you know periodic functions on ZP. So this I mean this sort of looks like a continuous function from zero to one with values in R in the real case. But I'm going to sort of do the same thing. And uh, uh, because, uh, and now I'm going to define a norm on this one to be the maximum value of this function. Uh, well, I mean, when I say maximum value, I have to, you know, Liang? The value is in Q. Yes. There is a, actually uh, a couple of questions. So one question is, why is this similar to L1 and not to L infinity? I thought L infinity means it don't, doesn't have this condition. L infinity is like you just have the sequence and then you don't have this condition. I 
probably call it more like there's something called C maybe sub zero, C sub zero, or sequences that tend to zero. Yeah, maybe C sub zero. I guess maybe maybe this is a bad notation. C sub zero. Sorry, maybe this is better. Other questions? Yes, I believe there is another one. Um, I was wondering if there is an analog of Cauchy, uh, Cauchy Shorts uh, inequality in the Piatic world. Cauchy Short inequality. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, what is Cauchy Short? That's one of that dot product. I don't think so. There is no. No, dot I don't think so. I mean, so here's the, maybe the difference. Like, like in Hubert's. So, so, so the point is that it's very interesting somehow. I think about it. so. So, uh, what is this? Uh, Hopefully, I don't get it wrong. It will be very embarrassing. So this is the if you have a Hilbert space, right? This is what this is the inequality you have. Is that right? That's correct. That's right. Uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen in the PID world. So basically, this is kind of replaced by this condition in some sense. Somehow. So you don't have this inner product thing. You just so so the also autonomous means this. They're somewhat different, I guess. But all the properties seem to be okay. Yeah, I mean, we see that somehow there's a theory over R, there's a corresponding theory over QP, not quite always the same. There's always something you have to change, of course. Great. The person says that, thanks, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is somehow the, 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 the yeah. The, I guess it's sort of the good. If you think about it in OR, you know, Hilbert spaces are good bottle spaces. Over QP, the ones with orthonormal basis are the good yeah, bottle spaces. Okay, so let's back to this. So I want to I want to say, okay, so I continue the function ZP with values in QP, and then the norm is the maximum value of this, meaning that you take the value of F at some point and then take the app's periodic norm of that, and then take the maximum of those. I want to say this norm is well defined because the ZP is compact, and therefore I guess this FZP will be some sort of bounded space in QP, and therefore this norm is always sort of achieve its maximum. And you can uh, you can see that this is a Banach space. You can very uh, we'll see it in a minute. Let me check each one of them. This is a Banach space, and and this is about the content of the theorem is that this has also normal basis. This is a so this is the content of the theorem. And it will actually give a also normal basis of this. So this is so called Mahler basis. Let me write the name here. I will write it again later. Okay. So let's quick check the properties of Mahler spaces for this space. First of all, it's complete for the norm. Uh, looks like so. I mean, right? You have a sequence of if you have a certain sequence of functions where the va maximum value of this sort, where the pi norm of the excuse me, maximum pi norm of the values somehow. Is, is used to uniform this sort of you know, convergence or something, and anyways, so this this is easy, I guess. Maybe I should write something. Sorry. So you have some sort of fi such that somehow if you have sort of a norm of fi plus one minus fi going to zero, then f must converge. Fi must converge to some f, right? Because because this. This will tell you that the difference between fi plus one and fi will be, you know, sort of uniformly goes to zero. Therefore, you can at least value-wise, they, they all go to f, and then uniform convergence will tell you this limit is also continuous. And the second condition is obvious, of course. You multiply every term by some number, and then there you go. And this is also follows from the triangle inequality from these each particular values of this. And norm being zero means that all the all the PI norm at each value at each point is zero, and therefore the max, therefore just a zero function. So this is very easy to show. It's a bar space. Uh, but let's let's sort of talk about the orthonormal basis. Uh, maybe 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 to 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 note that somehow if. You know, I want to get also normal basis. The first thing I have to find is that I want something norm being one. So what about what what do you mean, what I mean by norm being one? That 
I mean, or maybe norm at least less than equal to one, say. What that means is that all the FA, every A in VP, this norm is less than equal to one. In particular, that means the F of A belongs to ZP. So that's why I asked the following question. Can we, I mean, for the, for the minimum, can we find some examples of continuous function on ZP whose value lies in ZP, right? So that I can, you know, at least find some candidate of these spaces anyways. Uh, so let's, let's try to, you know, sure. think about something. First of all, polynomials with integers is coefficient. Of course, great. And, uh, and some power series, for example, exponential px, but they don't like that. Of course, they take values in zp. But if you think about it, this is really kind of a limit of, the, of these sort of polynomials. Uh, so maybe I'll maybe stick with the polynomials. That, those are somehow relatively easier. And of course, again, polynomials are a linear combination of these sort of powers. Great. So those are fine. Uh, you know that we're working with periodic worlds. Things can't be that easy. You know? you can't just take polynomials to get things to work. And in fact, if you sort of take powers all the way up to x to the p minus one, things should work the same way. But x to the p, you know, the p has to be something special. There has to be something to do with p, something, you know, strange. So let's give you another polynomial, which which doesn't have integral coefficient, but takes integral values. So this is a binomial coefficients. This, look, this is this function. Okay, so this is, this is I wanna say that this function takes value in ZP despite the, you have the p in the denominator. So let's try to prove this. Uh, let me just maybe get straight, uh, just go straight to give you the, somehow the, the, the great, the, the fantastic, the proof, I mean, uh, anyway, so, so let, let's, let's give a, give a slightly, not so easy to think of as proof. So first of all, let me, let me, let me do two things. If x belongs to n, integer, a natural number. Of course, this is an integer, right? Right, any binomial, binomial number is an integer, of course. That's fine. The next thing I want to point out, this is a continuous. I mean, despite there's a denominator in P here, but it's still a continuous function. That's not a problem. The last one is that N is actually dense. ZP. We know that ZP is a, is a completion, PI completion of the integers, but in fact, it's enough to take the natural numbers. And if you think about the PI expansion that we write down, there are, you know, essentially limit of positive integers. If you combine these three, you see that it's a continuous function. It takes value in ZP on the dense subset Z. So therefore, there's no choice. It has to, so this this xp must be in in zp for every x in zp because every Z, x in zp is a limit of uh, positive integers and therefore x choose p this function will be a limit of sort of periodic numbers therefore it must be also periodic integers and therefore will be a periodic integer itself. So this is some sort of something kind of a peculiar in some sense. You have something, you have P in the denominator, but still the polynomial will give you a number in ZP. If you think about this, this proof doesn't really, if you think, if you look at the surround of the whole proof, there's nowhere use the fact that I'm, cho I'm doing X choose P, I can choose anything. So here's race state of the theorem. One X, X choose two, X choose N, so on. This is an also normal basis of continuous function of ZP with values in QP. And this is called the Mahler basis.
So in particular, every continuous functions f from zp to qp can be written uniquely as let me write let me write star for this equation fx being sum of n greater than equal to zero of a n x n with uh, norm of a n of p goes to zero and i want to call this star this is writing it's called model expansion and maybe i should say that this is a very sentence similar to similar to taylor expansion a little bit except that somehow you know in the real world we're so used to talking about sort of uh, uh, polynomials and the power series Somehow, if you want to talk about sort of genuine periodic functions on ZP continuous functions, uh, that like 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 you see here, right? I mean, this, this power, this, these these monomials are not quite the correct thing. Turns out these binomial coefficients are somehow the correct thing to talk work with. Kind of interesting, I think. Uh, maybe I kind of stop here and see if there's, there are any questions about like what what we what we talked about so far, and I'll. After that, I'll give the proof of this. Uh, let's give it a few seconds. I don't see any questions. Oh, there you go. Can you remind me what a take Mueller lift is? Take what? Well, can you remind us what a tag Mueller uh, lift is? Tag Mueller lift. Oh, that's yeah. like earlier. Tag Mueller lift is uh, uh, what is what? Right, this tag Mueller lift. So basically, uh, this has a solution in here. If you start with an A here, then there's a unique solution to this equation here, which is congruent to this A, congruent to this A modulo P. That's called this Teichmuller lift. Maybe I can say that in my lecture yesterday, I did the Teichmuller lift for P equals seven. Um, oh, yeah. So the sixth oh. root of unity in, in Z seven come up. I don't think I called it a Teig Mueller lift, but I, I did find all the roots of x to the six minus one yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in Z seven. Teig Mueller lift is some sort of fancy name. <laughs> yeah. Of course, what's in general? I'm just getting used to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. I continue then. Right. Maybe so another on. like five minutes, Liang, or so. Or how much do you think you have? Can I do ten? Uh, oh, I'll try. Yeah, let's let's do. Um, if you can Go do five, five, good. If not, uh, keep going. Okay. Well, let me do five first. Sorry about. Sorry for running over. So step one is that. Well, first of all, let, let's find what is a n in terms of f. Uh, so let's assume this this holds and then try to find these a n's, right? So that's the whole point of this. Let's try to get this uh, Mahler expansion. So what you can do is you can really take, let's assume this works, let's evaluate x equals zero. Then you realize that, oh, wait a minute, these are all zero when x equals zero, right? So there's only one here. Then you see that I already know what a zero should be. It's just f of zero. And the left hand says f of zero and the right hand is just a, a zero. And I can do the next thing, x equals one. So on the left hand side, oh, maybe, on the left hand side, I get f1. On the right hand side, I get a0 times 1, right? Plus a1. And then starting from 1, these will be 0. So I just have, I just have two terms. So therefore, a1 is f1 minus f0. I can do the next one. This will give me a0 plus, now x equals 2. So I have 2x1 plus uh, x, and x choose 2. So I get a2. And the rest will be zero. So I, I can solve everything. Let me just tell you the answer. And you can imagine that I can repeat this. And then really somehow got all these sort of, uh, all these values of an I want it to be. 
I, I want to find. Let's do it more, maybe more systematic way. So I want to define f of i. I. There are other ways to write this. So let me just do this f bracket one. Just this is not a very standard notation to take the difference of this x. Okay, so it's a difference function of this x, and then I can take the n plus first distance to be the distance function for so this is sort of the distance function. This looks like if you think about this, why is that? Okay, this is a looks like this Taylor expansion. If you think about this, this looks like uh, not quite uh, not looks like, but this is an analog of uh, derivatives. Sorry, derivatives. Right. So therefore, you know, and also, and also maybe explaining why I want to introduce this function. So if the star is okay, as this, what is f of one? Let's see. F of one is will be. I take the sum. I will get a n. Now I have to take two functions that value the x plus one and x to take the difference so x plus one n minus x to n. Right, but this is by binomial equality. This is x choose n minus one, and in fact, you can run induction and see that if you take the nth difference of this function f, that's just the sum of n greater than or equal to n a n of x choose n minus m. Maybe I should say m greater than to m. So now this really looks like you know if you compare small expansion to Taylor expansion, right? I mean, you're taking sort of mth difference, really. Uh, somehow you basically, it looks like somehow you trunc you move these terms to the left or somehow you truncate it a little bit. And even better, you can, and, and actually you can, you, and then you can evaluate at x equals zero and then get a m is just basically a mth difference evaluated at zero. So this looks a lot like Taylor expansion somehow. But the, you use difference for the derivatives. So have proved that star is unique if it exists. Uh, I guess probably I'll just kind of a stop here uh, with the proof. And next, I'll pick up next time. I know I'm running over time. Sorry about that. Sorry about the connection issues. So next time I'll pick up the proof of this uh, and then say a little bit about the piatic measures and so on and so forth.